again, if I drop that diamond on the ground or I drive my car over that diamond, it will possibly survive that. It will absorb that shock and it will absorb it much, much better than the glass and it probably won't break. But the diamond is no stronger or better for, for that shock, for having it drop it on the ground or driven my car over it or stood on it or whatever else. Yeah, could you explain basically what is anti-fragility and um, what, what, what is interesting about it? Yeah, sure. I think um, the first thing to acknowledge is, is it, I, I wish I were clever enough to have come up with the term, but I, but I didn't. I, I read a book many years ago called Anti-Fragility uh, by uh, an author called uh, Nicholas uh, Taleb, or sorry, Nassim Taleb, should I say? And, uh, uh, and, you know, this concept really kind of resonated with me as a, as a physio uh, and a strength and conditioning coach working many, many years with both kind of recreational athletes and um, up to elite and kind of professional athletes, um, this idea really kind of resonated with me in such that, you know, if you think about um, something being fragile, if I ask someone, you know, give me an example of something being fragile, well, actually, you know, Matthew, give me an example of something fragile. This glass. Yeah, okay, so a glass. And if we drop that glass on the ground, it will, there will be a shock and it won't survive it likely and we'll be picking up the pieces afterwards. So, you know, it's fair to say a glass is, is fragile. Um, and so if I ask you for an example of something, what's the opposite of fragile then? Um, hmm. <laughs> Maybe like, uh, some, some, like a diamond. Like a diamond. Yeah, a diamond is, is pretty tough, pretty st strong stuff. You can <laughs> kind of cut through anything with a diamond is a good example, actually. First time someone's brought a diamond to the table as an example. <laughs> I was but, trying to think um, the hardest yeah, thing I, I could think of. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I think you do, I think you do really well. But if, 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 again, if I drop that diamond on the ground or I drive my car over that diamond, it will possibly survive that. It will absorb that shock and it will absorb it much, much better than the glass. And it probably won't break. But the diamond is no stronger or better for, for that shock, for having it drop it on the ground or driven my car over it or stood on it or whatever else. And so the interesting thing for me is very often when we have patients who have some kind of an injury, they kind of view themselves as being fragile. And, and we often have, you know, in healthcare narratives that suggest, you know, you're degenerative or you've torn this messages of kind of fragility and we try and return them to being strong. But the concept of anti-fragility is just that, Strong is only the middle of the spectrum. It extends all the way out to anti-fragile being the opposite of fragile. And so if you think about human, human physiology, we are anti-fragile. You can go to the gym and stress your system, of course, to a limit, to a point, uh, and return and recover and be better for that shock. You can go for your run. You stress your energy systems. You stress your musculoskeletal system. You give it a chance to adapt, and you can return fitter, faster, you know, better at getting up that hill or whatever it may be. And so, I think it's just a concept that really resonated with me that we should be with our patients always and our athletes shooting for anti-fragility. We don't want them to survive a given training session or rehabilitation. We want them to be better for it. Hmm. We don't want them to come to rehabilitation, come to physio, uh, go to the gym, weak and fragile, or viewing themselves as weak and fragile, and, and, and emerge just strong, just strong enough to survive. Surely we want them to have both a physiology and a mindset that they can absorb stresses and be better for them, and not to be wary of or afraid of stressors, to see them as a, you know, a positive stimulus for adaptation. And so I think we are anti-fragile. I think as, as, as physios, as coaches, as athletes, we need to uh, get into a mindset where we, we look beyond strong or robust and look to being uh, a, a capable of absorbing chaos, capable of absorbing shock and, and, and emerging better for it on, on a multitude of levels. So that's, that's kind of the philosophy I've always brought to kind of my role as a physio and SNC coach and and, uh, and and you know my idea is that if an athlete comes into rehab if they've got a busted Achilles or a, and they have had their ACL repair they should come out of rehab better than they were before hmm. so it's almost like an opportunity for growth coming to rehab because it, you sort of think of it like a like a spectrum and it's like well we got performance here and then we've got injury and rest here and we have sort of rehab yeah. is that my dog barking sorry <laughs> you have rehab 
in between to try and get back to performance, but there's not, we never really approach it with the, shh, socks, quit it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, right. We never really approach it with an opportunity to, to become, you know, better than we were previously. And um, that's right. Yeah, and I, I think you do get that sometimes with your clients, where especially the ones who who you get to stick around or maybe come back a couple of times with multiple injuries. When you when you explain these concepts with them, and I didn't have this wording before, but I would try and use the same concept of adaptation. I would call it, um, mm. and the the idea is that you know if you get an injured runner to you coming in with you know various different. Um, I, 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 again, I, I call them like fragility beliefs. Do you know what I mean? Mm. My knee is kind of wearing out. That's why it hurts. I shouldn't run on it sure. so much. You know, these are, these are common things. But then if you can almost sort of through a process of education and experience and then rehab, you get them to the point where they don't believe those things anymore. They're actually, as a, as a runner, they're a more uh, formidable kind of, um, individual, you know? Sure. I, I think I think like that needle flicking over can be kind of transformative to an mm. athlete in the rehabilitation process. And I think from our side, you know, from the for the person prescribing rehabilitation or kind of managing the process, it, it's it also allows for a wider view. Because I think very often you think about just making this body part strong. So someone's come in with a sore Achilles or a sprained ankle or whatever. You're saying, well, I want to just make this ankle strong or, you know. Well, think about the whole person. I think that anti-fragility concept is really about the whole person. What else about this person can we improve to uh, and work on what we focus on what we can do? Because in injury, there's always things you can't do, but putting a focus on what you can do and what are the many things across the performance spectrum that you can uh, put to use to help that person emerge better on the far side. So they they absorbed um, uh, an ankle injury or a knee injury, but they emerge emerge better not not with a better knee or a better ankle, but as a better athlete. On mm, the back end. Yeah, it's like the, the that, sort of net to go wider effect. view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So that's that's the philosophy that I've kind of uh, you know it really resonated with me as an idea, uh, and, and it seemed to kind of parallel what I've been trying to do in clinic for years. And, and as you say, it just put a nice term that encompassed it all. Hmm. Yeah, because I, I was listening to the book that you had mentioned after after I listened to that podcast. And um, as he was talking, I was thinking, we do have a word, we have a word, it's adaptation. And um, but then he sort of addressed that. And he was saying, you know, looking at it in one sense, adaptation is, um, you know, you overcome struggles, but you don't necessarily get better for them. You know, you, you sort yeah. of take them in stride a little bit. Um, but, you know, um, humans or uh, any little sort of, um, I don't know what the word is, but like a, a, a mammal, do you know what I mean? Will respond to stress as long as it's not too much and actually become stronger for the experience, not, um, not break down. And I think a, a lot of people, when they get injured, especially older people, which is why I was, um, interested in talking about this is, um, lots of runners I get, um, I mean, they're not really older. They're like <laughs> in their forties and fifties. But they're getting more, and more injuries, yeah, and it's and it's like you got thirty or forty years of running ahead of you, but they're they're thinking they mm. have to sort of titrate that carefully because now let's say their Achilles is troubling them or their knee, they've been told they have arthritis and and the, and they're sort of thinking, well, I've got X amount of steps left in me now. It's it's like yeah. the car tire that's wearing out kind of thing. Yeah, sure. And I think like you've touched on something that really resonates with me there. You know, this idea you said, hey, look, if you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s and you're running, you still got a long runway left. You know, you've still got plenty of running years and miles in you potentially. But how how um, how that runway can be kind of compromised and shortened just by merely implanting beliefs that hmm. You know, you're wearing out. You're degenerative. You know, you need to limit those steps, etc. And that 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 can be a really powerful and unfortunate event when that happens. And it's um it's much easier, I suspect, to to sow those seeds 
uh, of fragility than it is to kind of reverse mm. um, that process. And I think, uh, you know, looking at a health system point of view and, and, and the kind of both implicit and explicit messaging that gets put out there to people in the world, I, I think we really need to try hard to to get ahead of that and, and not implant those messages because the, the brain is, is fertile soil when it comes to uh, messaging around danger and fragility. And we need to uh, be very cautious there, I think. Why do you think that is? Why do you think, um, you know, because we all we all understand that we know what training is, especially runners, right? We know that if we go and run regularly, not too much, but not too little, we'll be able to run further and faster. Like we understand training effects. Um, sure. That sort of this, you know, we don't have a word for anti-fragility. And, and that, that sort of concept is not, it, like you say, it doesn't seem as easy for us to just latch onto as, you know, things just wearing out the more you use them um, and injuries being a sign of um, time to quit doing that. <laughs> yeah, look, I think I think it's interesting. It's 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 one of those things where I think the professions involved can be enormously helpful. You know, uh, you get injured, you can go see your physio, go see your doctor. They can be enormously helpful. But I also think on a wider level, some of the messaging that has been historically there and is kind of pervasive in society can be unhelpful. You know, for example, a lot of the message around manual handling, you know, keep your mm. back straight. Your discs are like a donut. They're going to explode if you lift mm. things up. They're very powerful. That kind of imagery um, is really uh, is really powerful. And and. You know, it's it's funny for me, even having been like being a physio and having had episodes of back pain in the past, I can still remember, you know, one of my teachers in school saying in class one time when I was in high school, um, oh, you know, you, you're all lucky, you're all young, but wait until you're a little bit older. Once you hurt your back, it never gets better. And like oh. that still resonates <laughs> with me. And you know, so so there, yeah, it's interesting. Like you you revert to those available experiences and that available narrative. And that information is simply everywhere. It's in the the books you read and the 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 you know the the messaging in workplaces. It's uh, you know I've seen messages like that on the train and on the bus. You you. It's in TV shows, etc. So I think it, it, it's, it is kind of pervasive and it's, it's implicit um, a lot of the time. And it's also very explicit in our interactions. And we also have available resources. You'll, 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 you'll hear it, the, the one friend who, who ran on some injury and did themselves some terrible damage. And that will stick in your mind. And, and, and you'll never hear it of the thousands of friends and people in that marathon who ran on you know, pain or whatever else. And, and, and it was no problem in the end. Hmm. And so I think we, we kind of latch on to those those uh, those uh, kind of significant stories like that. And I think there's a there's an information bias. Um, yeah, yeah, we, we think, sort of bias. You know, Just as you were saying that, I was thinking, I remember hearing a story one time. It was, I think they were talking about persisting pain and then and, and paying attention to hmm. danger. We, we sort of have this bias to latch on to more um, negative uh, information like potential yeah, yeah. risks and dangerous things because like yeah the 10 times you you know that something moves in the bushes and you know one time out of a million it's a snake but you presume it's a snake every time you know then the, the sure. one time it is you, it doesn't get you kind of thing. <laughs> so it, it, yeah I, I think we're primed in that way. I think it's why newspapers uh, generally have negative headlines. Yeah. You know, if you're to read the newspaper, the world is full of bad people doing bad things. <laughs> I got to think out of almost eight, I got to think about almost, uh, uh, almost 8 billion people or whatever we are now on earth. There's got to be, there's got to be some good people doing some good things, <laughs> but it doesn't make the news for whatever reasons. And, um, you know, I think I think they've latched onto something and they've recognized early that, that, that kind of uh, bias exists. You know, if I, uh, I think it's uh, the example that's often given is if I if I give you a million dollars, you'll be saying, "Oh, gee, Merv, that's that's magnificent. That's that's very generous." Um, but if the next day I called you up and I said, "Listen, Matthew, I need nine hundred of that back. I need nine hundred of that back quickly," <laughs> think you'd be a bit upset, you know. And however, if I had just rang you up in the first place and said, "Hey, Matthew, here's a hundred thousand dollars," you'd be like, "Oh, gee, that's that's great," and you'd be as happy as if I gave you a million, right? Because you wouldn't know. So, look, humans are humans are tricky, and, and we live in in, in a, you know a complex society and world with with all sorts of messaging. And I think, unfortunately, when it comes to kind of pain and injury, this idea of you know once you have pain, people assume they're injured, which isn't necessarily the case, and and the information that goes with that can be unhelpful. And I think there is a degree of 
um, historically, uh, this idea, I think, that, that people have sought to insert themselves as the solution to said uh, issue. Mm. So the narrative of you are broken or degenerative is probably uh, self-serving, whether that's, uh, and, and maybe that's a controversial thing for me to say, but whether that's um, even uh, explicit for those people, I don't know. But as an observation of how the system has worked historically, I think many people have latched on to that uh, bad news narrative in order to insert oneself as the good news. Right, yeah. Yeah, because there's a sort of, um, there's an incentive there, right? Because if there's a problem, you can solve it. But, you know, if, if you get a runner coming yeah. in and they're saying, you know, my knee's been hurting for a few weeks, I had an x-ray, there's some arthritis there, and you say, yeah, don't worry about it, it'll be fine, just keep going. You only get, like, one appointment yeah. with them. It's not, it's not very good for business. Yeah, and the, look, there's the business side of it, but there's also just that I, I think, you know, overwhelmingly people do want to help. You know, they have yeah, that compulsion yeah. to to act. They have that compulsion to act and they want to help. You know, I think a lot of the time, rather than it being just, I, I hope, rather than just being mm. dollar driven, I think it's driven by a genuine desire to, to do what I can to help this person over the line. And of course, we never have that control scenario where we just go, you know, Matthew, I, I honestly think you just need to chill for a few weeks, ease back and we'll make some slight modification and away you go. Um and it's hard because some people will as uh, will have expectations that that you will kind of hold their hand more closely to the process and intervene as well. So it is it is a complicated relationship and a, co a complicated scenario. But I do think there's probably a time uh, where very often a bit of watchful waiting would be mm. a, a useful uh, road for for everyone involved. Yeah, and then um, there's that saying, isn't there? That was a Voltaire who said medicine is you know, keeping the client or the patient occupied when uh, while nature takes its course. I think I've butchered that, but that's the gist of it. <laughs> and um, I, I almost, my whole career sort of felt like, you know, this this, this anti-fragility that humans have, um, you know, I, I almost, it was like a dirty little secret. Do you know what I mean? It's like, if I just don't make it worse and, and I give them some decent advice, even if I do the wrong stuff, their, their knee will get better. Their Achilles will get better. They'll be able to run more in four weeks than they can now. And it's just because we have this um, capacity to, um, to, to, um, to, to recover from whatever has set us back. Although, obviously, sure. sometimes it goes completely off the rails and the person... Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and one of the challenges, of course, is you can't pick in advance who the person whose trajectory won't follow the path that you predict. Mm. You know, you, it's very hard that that person comes in, two people come in with a very similar condition, very similar history, and one of them might do extraordinarily well with a bit of watchful waiting, just chill, make some slight modifications, and away you go. But you could give that same advice to the person, they could take a very negative trajectory. So I think like it, it, it is, you know, when I say, uh, you know, a lot of it is driven by the compulsion incentives in, in in healthcare service over years there's part of that 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 is a bit blunt and doesn't recognize those types of uncertainties that we deal with daily um but i think um reassurance and watchful waiting is a is, is a very useful thing um, a lot of the time yeah and um and so if we, if we try and make it a little specific just kind of for the runners um because i know you have an, mm. an interest in you do research in in the tendon sphere is that uh is that correct? You sort of have an interest yeah. in tendinopathy and tendon problems as well. Yeah, I, I have an interest in, in in Achilles tendinopathy as a physio and as a researcher. But I I acknowledge that I'm part of a research team, um, and, and so I'm part of a team with some other really great people who do excellent work in Achilles tendinopathy. So so James Debenham uh, at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, being one of them, and also we have a, a PhD student, Miles Murphy, who's who's really mm, kicking oh, yeah. goals and doing some brilliant stuff in the in the tendinopathy world. So so when I uh, uh, say that I'm interested in Achilles tendinopathy, I probably know less about it than all of the people who surround me. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, you probably have a unique group around you, though, um, of particularly <laughs> knowledgeable people. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm very, very fortunate. They say you become the mean of those uh, who, with whom you surround yourself, and I'm certainly incredibly uh, fortunate in my 
in my colleagues, um, both from a research and um, teaching point of view at the university and also in the clinic where I work. Uh, we've got a really great team. So, um, yeah, we see a lot of a lot of runners, a lot of triathletes with uh, tendon issues. So what? I guess the two the, there was two immediate examples that you know when I heard you talking about anti fragility, um, I thought older people, you know, older runners who were worried about wearing themselves out. That was the first thing I thought about, mm. and then I also thought as well uh, tendons um, and um, particularly knee osteoarthritis because that tends to be what the runners come sure. in with. You know, that's the, sure. the and and there's a lot of worry. And you, you, there's a lot of sort of back and forth with the with the, the the runner at that point, trying to convey this concept of anti fragility to to take the tendon and load it so it becomes stronger than it is. When their their mm. inkling, their their sort of um, their uh, instinct is to this is hurting. I need to do less with it. And the same with the osteoarthritic knee is you know this is hurting. Mm. Um, we've seen some changes on x-ray that are, you know, degenerative changes on x-ray. I need to do less with it. And so when you get those people, how do you approach that? Um, how, how do you get them on board with this idea of, you know, it, you can become stronger than you are actually um, through this process? Yeah, sure. Um, look, obviously, it depends on the individual, of course, but and their individual history. But but I think a big thing is... is, is um, is conveying that idea that your tendons and that your system, your body can adapt to loading. And using that same analogy, look, you know, when you go to the gym, you, you do some bicep curls, they're sore and stiff for a couple of days, then they're bigger, slight, slightly bigger, slightly stronger, and you, you go back and you, 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 you do the same thing. And understanding that often in these tissues that are, that, that, um, that are uh, you know, that you're troubled with at the time, um, that same process uh, can actually be in play. And very often, I think with the patients with tendinopathy, for example, it's an easier conversation to have because very often they've tried resting it for a few weeks. So they'll say things like, well, I rested it and it felt great because I was resting it. And But then when I went back and ran, it actually just came back again, or it was even worse then after a period of resting it. And so kind of explaining and understanding that loading Though it's not the entire picture in tendinopathy, that would be a very kind of uh, broad brushstroke statement to make. But 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 loading and, and over and underloading that kind of cycle of over and underloading it is is part is the crux of it. So so loading is both the cause and solution to the problem. And what we have to find is is the right kind of balance where where clearly when you rested for too long was was or rest it was kind of too little loading for it and obviously what you were doing beforehand was too much and we need to work together to refine and find a level of loading that is right that it can then slip into this uh, level where it can adapt um, be positively rest recover load it again adapt positively rest recover and get away from that kind of negative spiral of of kind of overloading the tendon or it having insufficient capacity to kind of positively adapt. And I think, so I think the conversation is usually pretty easy to have, I think with the Achilles tendon patients, simply because they, they've likely experienced it. They've mm -hmm. not maybe put it in those same terms, but once you reframe their experience, what they told you about how it responded to their running history or their training program or the period of time they took off. Hey, I went on holidays and didn't run for a couple of weeks, but it was fabulous. And then I went back running. Of course, I got sore. So, so I think the big thing is, is, is linking and latching on to their story and how it's behaved for them and making clear this idea that, look, what we need to try and do a lot of the time is, is, is just get the level right. And whether, whether they're a, a slower um recreational runner or they're an elite runner those concepts are the same it's just that the entry point is um is is you know obviously you know titrated appropriately to their level of running and what their where their symptoms are at but the key thing is that we've just got to get the level right um and then the if it was you know the same case but in an older runner and um, does it change do we have less you know, adaptive capacity, uh, less, are we less anti-fragile, you know, as we get older, are we less adaptable? Um, 
I don't know if you can say one is less anti fragile. I don't know if that's. Uh, I, I think there. I think there are probably just some. Some. I think there are probably just some other considerations. You know, and it is funny. You know, it, it depends on the individual. I've seen people who are older and can run multiple consecutive days, and it just isn't problematic for them. And I've seen younger people who need to space their runs out or or mm. or, or be much more careful with their loading. I think. I think. I'm cautious to kind of go with the broad brushstrokes and say, look, older people, um, you don't, uh, or you won't adapt as well. I think, I think you really have to take it on an individual basis because you could make an argument that some of those older people who've been running for a very long time, they've built up a, a real bank. They've got a lot of hay in the barn hmm. in, in terms of running mileage in their legs and, and, and the training of their energy systems. So of course, look, lots of the recovery systems um, maybe aren't as, uh, as efficient uh, when you're 70 as compared to when you're 17. But I think the concept still um, still holds true. Uh, and I think that, you know one of the considerations when we're talking about age and aging, obviously when uh, in female populations to do with menopause, perimenopause, menopause, and kind of postmenopausal times, that, that's when um, tendinopathy prevalence is, is, is very high and you can often see kind of multiple tendinopathies. Um, of course that, that so, there are other considerations that come with age that aren't just about loading. Hmm. So I kind of just flag that. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of taking the runner as a, as an individual, but yeah, I guess, I guess maybe I'm a little guilty of that too. Sometimes I think that, you know, someone's someone in their sixties is going to be, uh, the rehab is going to go slower than someone in their twenties. But as you say, there's so many different other factors that are involved as, as in addition to age that would might mean that is completely incorrect 100 percent. i mean i've been surprised so many times because you know I'll, I'll i'll walk into that consult with that bias and i've had patients in their 50s 60s I mean, who, who responded so quickly and so well and it surprised me which is great and i've had patients who are much younger whose you know kind of condition has been much more uh stubborn hmm. so and I, I know you're interested in um, pain as well because i heard a, a podcast with you you would um, I think it was GLSPT, and you you were talking about um, pain and and where does that sit in relation to because uh, when we're talking about anti fragile here and we're talking about stronger versus weaker and getting stronger or getting weaker, um, where does pain fit into that? You know? Yeah, look, I think I think pain parallels really nicely with that concept. I think. It's, you know, this idea that we have that, um, for example, if you're someone who's had pain for a really long time and um, uh, then you have a, you've been pain free and then you have a flare up, for example, that idea that understanding that a flare up doesn't mean you've actually damaged yourself or you've re injured uh, that body part or being able to kind of disavow or, 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 or disavow is probably not the right word, being able to create that um understanding that pain isn't always about tissue damage i think that's part of that kind of uh, anti-fragile concept that you can have a flare-up and you can continue through a flare-up and you can come out the other side of that actually okay that you don't if you have a flare-up of a condition you don't need to take to bed for six weeks for example um so i think i think the idea of anti-fragility uh, it, it probably holds true as well in the presence of pain and then what does that mean you know for a runner who's listening to this and say that you know, they, they, their knee is hurting and, and when they're running. I mean, obviously, it's not just keep running. How, how do they, yeah. you know, how do they use this information, you know, to, to actually help themselves if they are having pain? And let's say it's getting worse as the months pass, they're, they're able to run less and their, their knee pain, for example, is getting worse. How, how can they use this concept to actually help themselves? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think, look, I think the first thing is obviously if someone's having pain and it's an ongoing thing and it's escalating. I, I do think, you know, seeking good advice is a is a really good way to go. Um, and so I, I I see the idea of anti-fragility uh, sitting within that rehabilitation uh, framework. So so that being an underlying philosophy, I suppose, for the, the uh, rehabilitation journey that they take in hand with you know, good professional guidance, wherever that may be in the world that they are. Um, but I do think uh, what's really important is um, that even if you have pain and even if it turns out you've 
had an injury of some kind and you had to take some time off is that you spend that time making yourself better. It's not a passive process. And I think that's the big thing that you can, you can still add stress to that system and emerge better on the other side. So, you know, if whether that be, look, I got to stop running or I got to reduce my running or, you know, I just don't do my hard interval run for a couple of weeks, but I replace that with a gym session or whatever else that it might be, that, that the focus is always on what you can do, not on what you can't do. Right. And that's okay, really, really yeah. important. And so, I think then is uh, focusing on, yeah, and focusing on what you can do is, um, is really about uh, sometimes accessing information from professionals about what can you do. So, so to give an example, I had, I had a lovely, um, lovely patient in, uh, a few years ago, and he had a stress fracture heading into of his tibia heading into the um, Ironman World Championships in Hawaii, and so he couldn't run, which was pretty reasonable under the circumstance. Um, but he was adamant that he was going to go to Hawaii and he was going to run on the day and. It, of course, we're consenting adults and it's my role to try and help as best I can. And so, of course, we both had an understanding that the wheels were going to fall off the wagon uh, in terms of his run in the last probably 10 to 15 kilometers. You know, if you if you go into that race, you know, having not ran for, for, for a while, that's that's going to be a rough day. And uh, so but, but the key thing is, you know, he had this wonderful mindset. He kind of came to me saying, well, what can I do to, you know, sure, I'm going to lose some time on my run. What can I do to offset that? What can I do to make myself better in that time? And so we embarked upon a strength program in order to optimize his power output on the bike. So we were saying, okay, well, you're not lifting. This is something that in that time would likely give you a positive adaptation where you'll push the bike harder. You'll be able to generate more watts on the bike, shall we say. Uh, and so as a result, he went there and he had a fabulous day. He, he went brilliantly on the swim. He he absolutely rode the legs off all the competition. And 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 then the wheels fell off the wagon on the run <laughs> on the back end, which was which was always going to happen. But but the key thing is, you know, is was focusing what we can do, and 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 ultimately he got across that f finish line. I suspect faster than he would have if he just stayed at home and didn't run during that time. He hmm. instead of some of his running sessions, he was in the gym putting together what a strength program that was going to serve him well on the bike, but also serve him well hopefully when he returns to running. Hmm. That I mean, that brings up an interesting question, though. I'm sure you know runners with pain or with injuries will be thinking as they listen to us talk about this: is what if I make it worse? You know, so in his situation, what, you know, what if he makes it worse? If the person has knee arthritis, what do I? What if I make it worse? Same with the Achilles. Like, how, how are people to know? Um, yeah. Is it? Yeah. And that's a natural thing for anyone. I mean, it's, it's the same for me, even though I've spent years working kind of in tendinopathy and in back pain and things like that. When I, when I, you know, I'm out in the garden, I pick something up and my back gets sore. My immediate place is, oh gosh, this is no good. What if it doesn't go away? Like my, like my school teacher told me, right? So, <laughs> so like it, it's, I still can't divorce myself from those thoughts, right? And it's completely natural and normal. I, I think where it comes to is having someone who can help guide the process. Mm. So a physio, a coach, whoever is well informed, who who can help guide guide them through that process. And of course, then whatever is put in place is that it's sensibly programmed. So, for example. When he was in the gym, we were quite specific about what he was doing. He certainly wasn't jumping and down, up and down off boxes, for example, which likely would have made him worse. So, so the the interventions that are put in play have to be kind of those choices have to be judicious, uh, and they need to be uh, advised and guided by kind of you know an appropriate professional. But the key thing is always putting that focus on what you can do. But of course, if something starts to get worse, it's being able to have the conversation. Go, look, I actually don't think this is going in the right direction, and and change lanes and try other options always kind of well-meaning and trying to help that person get towards the best outcome but 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 no rehab program ever goes smoothly hmm. you know there's always hiccups there's always curveballs because we can't predict the future and if i if i could i'd have won the lotto every week um but as yet i've not and so we can't predict the future and we have to have contingency plans and things that we modify and change. Um, so, but it, so it is a natural thing to worry, well, will I make this worse? So that comes down to having the knowledge of maybe what injury is happening at the time and also what injury is um, 
or what interventions being used so you know and how it's being prescribed but but for example in in the achilles tendon world um they have demonstrated in trials that when people kind of run and and lift and do things allowing a certain amount of pain a low level acceptable amount of pain if you will um that those people have a similar outcome to people who kind of hold back and try and keep things you know pain free if you will and so if if my trajectory was going to be the same over 12 months at the end of 12 months my 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 kind of pain and disability associated with having a sore achilles was going to be the same i would rather be the person who gets to run because life is better when you get to run mm-hmm. rather than the person who's being super cautious etc now that doesn't mean you go out and you're super reckless you throw caution to the wind and you know on every even on your slow steady run you got tears rolling down your eyes um you know and you're biting a leather strap because your 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 injury hurts so badly and you go well, this will be fine cuz Matthew and Merv said I should be anti fragile <laughs> i think if that's the case one is kind of you know you've kind of missed the point or missed the mark a little bit i think i think the key thing is it requires that guidance um but even recently with you know with with hamstring injuries there was a there was a trial on on i think there were soccer players with um hamstring injuries and one group um was allowed to have you know a low level if you will acceptable amount of pain while doing their ex- exercises and the other group um kind of were held back that little bit to prevent that and again you have this outcome which is which is kind of similar and and so again if 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 it's suggesting that your rehab doesn't always need to be pain free and i think that fits with that you know you asked about pain and you asked about anti fragility is is understanding that just if you have a little bit of pain while you're doing your rehab or doing your exercises it doesn't always have to be pain free certainly under those kind of circumstances but of course if you've got a you know a stress fracture or some kind of major pathology that's you know suboptimal and that's why there's that need for guidance for make sure you know you go see Matthew and he rules out that you've got one of these nasty things and can give that advice and has a whole lot of options that you can try to put focus in other areas that make you better as an athlete and so it's about having that guidance and having you know I I think about the idea of um you know the 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 project is getting that athlete back to whatever level they need to be at and beyond and that physio or coach or whomever that team project managing that trajectory you know so rather than i go to the physio to get exercises or i go to the physio to get whatever whatever other intervention it's actually that is about project managing that that process and within that project there are lots of different things that could be tried yeah i love that i, I was uh... Uh, listening to someone talk about i wonder if it was you on a podcast like a project manager kind of analogy i was like i really like that because feeling like i'm telling someone what to do is the last thing i want you know it, it's not a helpful no. uh, scenario to get into if someone's got an injury they have half an hour maybe a week with me but, you know it's 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 they've got all this other time where they have to make decisions and they have to understand what to do and and that we really have to have come to some sort of a like a heuristic about how to make those decisions not not a do these exercises run this amount and you'll be fine because the like you said it's it's just we can't predict things to that degree but as you were talking now I was thinking you know on a practical level um someone's got knee pain and they come to see you and you say you know mm-hmm. um some amount of pain is okay but do you give them any specific guidance on how to know how much is too much or or do you more try and leave it with them and see what they kind of come up with and do i'm just wondering you know if if the runners yeah. are listening and they're like how do i know if this is too much pain uh, you know how yeah. do I- yeah that's that's a really, really good question and it's um it's actually something that i you're know, working with some students lately and we've kind of having this conversation they were saying well you know in the studies in some of the studies they 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 say look if your pain is between 0 and 2 that's kind of out of 10 and 10 being you know the worst pain imaginable think of putting your foot in the fire type of thing right so 0 to 2 the same that's kind of acceptable pain that's the green zone that's no worries and this comes from uh, Karen Silbernagel's work in Achilles tendinopathy it's called the pain monitoring model and then they're kind of saying well look if you're between 3 and 5 that's kind of okay um we'll keep an we won't make but too many progressions we'll keep a lid on things keep an eye on it but that should be okay to proceed providing it's stable and if it's exceeding 5 then that's problematic 
And, and I understand why they have to do that in trials because they have to be able to report a system that's the same for everyone. But obviously, you know, everyone's different and your history is different than my history, Matthew. We, we're just different people living in our own worlds. And so your five out of 10 and my five out of 10 could be, you could be, you know, five out of 10 for you could be 10 out of 10 for me, right? They're, they're going to be different. And so I think it's probably more nuanced than just sticking a number on it. I think it's mm -hmm. better, you know, having a conversation with the patient that what's an acceptable amount for them. So if it's a low level that's acceptable for them, it doesn't have to have a number value on it, then that's fine. But what I really like about that pain monitoring model is a couple of the things that, that people maybe sometimes forget, and it's kind of in the, in the, in the, uh, in, in the notes of it, is that it's... Um, it's that look with because Achilles tendinopathy is characterized by having pain, uh, you know, during the event, but also maybe the next morning pain and stiffness, and and also it lasts a long time. And so, so if your pain is 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 a is a low level but acceptable at one week, and a low level but acceptable one week, and a low level but acceptable, but all those weeks it's still increasing. So it's increasing but still acceptable. That's probably suboptimal. Hmm. So what you'd want to, but at the same time, if your pain is the same week in week out, but your mileage is able to increase, or you're able to do some quick faster intervals, or you're able to integrate some hill running, whatever it is. So if you think about it, your your function as a runner is improving, but the pain is the same. Then then you may have a chat with that patient or that person might be like, I'm absolutely fine with that. If it's a low level of pain and I can increase my running, then I'm heading towards my goal and I'm winning, right? And so I, I don't think your rehab has to be entirely pain-free. I think one would be waiting a very, very, very long time hmm. for that to, to be the case. And there'd be performance um, issues associated with that. Um, but also, um, I think the level of pain that's acceptable for everyone will be individual. So I think you need to be aware of the pain um, level during the activity and the next morning and also that it's stable over time ideally ideally heading downwards over time but certainly if it's stable over time and your function or level of running is improving i would also consider that a a victory as well and mm. so but one thing you have to be really careful is you also don't want to like if you attend to things too much like i i can still if i think hard enough about it i can still remember when i when i flipped off i hit, I hit a, a friend of mine with my butt we were riding together on our bikes and i ran into the back of him when i was a kid and i went over the handlebars and landed down and then the bike flipped in the air and then landed down on top of me and i you know right now i've got like hair standing up in the back of my neck with that memory <laughs> i can almost yeah. feel where that bike kind of hit me uh, across my pelvis at uh, that time, uh, even though I was only you know young at the time, I, I can still remember remember that. I could probably still feel it if I really want to. And I think we have to be really careful. You don't mm. want the runners to be out there on every step going, does that hurt? Does that hurt? Does that hurt? Does that hurt? They need to be out there running free and relaxed and focusing on what it is they should be focusing on that run, whether it's their their cadence, whether it's their pace, or whether it's just a chat they're having to their mate. You know, be out there running and enjoying running, not like attending to that sore body part because under those circumstances you can be guaranteed you're going to feel that pain you know mm. it's almost like you want them to pay attention to the pain when the pain comes and calls upon their attention rather than them going to look for it you know um otherwise yeah. you yeah your nervous system is going to amplify whatever's there so like if i think about my socks now i can feel them but i couldn't a minute ago and if I'm yeah. really worried about my shin pain and I'm thinking about it, trying to, you know, is this an acceptable level of pain every third step as I'm running? You know, my nervous system, I presume, is just going to pay more and more attention to that, um, sure. that uh, experience. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's, it's really interesting. You know, I remember, so you, you can sometimes get patients to fill in training diaries and, and, and note their pain, which can be really useful for some people because they go, hey, look, I, my pain's been kind of fine in the last few weeks. But then when they look back in the diary, they might actually go, well, actually, I've been rating it. and It's actually going downhill. That's great. But also you can, I, I certainly remember one patient who I saw uh, in particular, but there have been others where he, he explained to me how when he was out in the world, living his life, doing his rehab, he'd actually be doing okay. And his pain would be um, kind of uh, start to creep into his mind and start to be amplified. He'd have more pain in the few days before he'd come and see me. 
And uh, he, he had this trend. He had this trend over several kind of weeks and months, however long we were seeing each other. And he was like, you know, I'd be off doing it for a few weeks. That'd be great. Then, you know, the few, and, he, and you know, he'd always be saying, it's a good job I'm coming to see you now because it's been really bad the last few days, but it was great before then. And then, you know, a month later, it's it was been really bad the last few days, but it was great in the intervening period. And again, and again, and, and we had this chat and, he was, and it was actually, he brought it up. He goes, hey, do you think it could be something about like, just knowing that I'm coming to see you and I'm starting to really think about mm. how bad my pain is and I need to be able to report it and maybe it's the environment or whatever else. And um, and, uh, and I was like, well, like, let's try it. And so we actually went to, even though he, he lived here in Perth, so he could come to the clinic, we actually went to uh, kind of remotely doing things in order to kind of get around that idea. Did it work? You know, so he wasn't... Yeah, it worked, right? And huh? so so he wasn't there sitting. Yeah, he wasn't there sitting in his car, driving there, thinking to himself, oh, how bad's my pain? How bad's my yeah. pain? This, that, good. He just, you know, the whole process, I suppose. And I don't know what part of the process it was. Was it being in the clinic? Was it the anticipation? Maybe I'm just really scary. Like, I really don't know. But, <laughs> but it seemed to, for whatever reason, interrupt that um, cycle, which hmm. was great. And so, so it goes to show like the, the, the pain isn't, it's not just about what's happening in tissues, that's for sure. Um, and also you need to be really conscious. And that's one of the, the danger areas with, with patients kind of saying, look, it's okay to have some pain that's acceptable, but also then they're out there kind of focusing on it constantly because that also undermines the process. So there's a, there's a balancing act to be had. Yeah. And then um, another thing I, I thought about as you were, as you were talking about, about you know getting help you know with a with an achilles pain or mm -hmm. a, a knee pain i think the knee pain will make a better example here because there is a lot of people i've had one at least in the last two weeks who has been told by his doctor that they need to stop running because the knee pain um is coming from arthritis and you know that the more they run the quicker they're going to wear it out and you know so we're sitting sure. here and saying you know you need you need good guidance from a professional and h how do you know if you've been told that you shouldn't run that that's an opinion you should trust or that you need you know um second opinions or do you need to hear it from a few different people do you know what i mean like how 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 would someone yeah. know look that's actually really hard and, and because different professions operate off very different kind of frameworks of reasoning as well right so that's that is problematic um for the like person out in the real world to to kind of know what advice is is kind of um um legitimate or not some people will, of course will always go shopping until they find advice yeah, that's the other that thing i was thinking narrative. like right. you know if you're just going to keep going to different people until you get the answer you want you know um that's another yeah. problem, right? And because think, there are, there's room yeah. for opinion on these things. Yeah, of course. And there are some people, for example, who'd have, let's say, arthritic knees and sore knees for whom telling them not to run is, 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 is terrible advice. And they could continue running and maybe the running might need to be modified slightly. Or maybe there might need to be some strength training stuff that parallels it. Or maybe there needs to be some other strategies that facilitates keeping that person running. And there are also some people who, for example, if they continued running, they actually genuinely do get worse. And so that, that's problematic and it's hard to pick that person in advance. But as a general rule, I think if there's something that someone loves doing in their life, they should try and, you know, hopefully find a way to continue to do that and provide that and find the help that allows them to do it in some way or some or, or another. And I think that's where we as a, as kind of people involved in the healthcare system need to be better at our messaging and, and that kind of generic rules, like you've got degenerative changes in your knees, which is really saying you've got gray hairs and wrinkles in your knees. You shouldn't run. Right. I think advice like that and kind of wide, like you know, medical professionals, allied health professionals, all around, we need to be careful about those kind of blanket statements where we say things like, look, you've got degenerative knees, that means you should never run. Uh, or you've got osteoarthritis, that means you should never run. And I think, you know, the like degenerative changes on, on scans, I mean, almost everyone has them, oh, you know, they're gray hairs and wrinkles. And so um, I think we need to do better on how we report that 
uh, the, how radiologists report that information and how that's interpreted by the clinicians and how those messages are passed on to patients. But nonetheless, it's really tricky because patients, they, they, they trust the advice of the, hmm. you know, they, they've gone to this trusted professional and they've told them this. So how do they know when they should try and find a second opinion? I think, I think firstly, it falls on the clinicians not to dispense information like that unless they have a really good reason to. I think, though, on the on the part of the patient, I think if there's something that you really love doing and it's not, you know, harmful to the world or illegal, um, then <laughs> there's nothing wrong with <laughs> there's nothing wrong with you trying to find legitimate ways to continue and keep that as part of your life, you know, and saying, well, look, I'm, if you, so, if you seek a second opinion on ways to try and on, mm. on ways to try and do that. So, if you've been told, look, you can't run, um, then perhaps they should. Um, Look, maybe it might be best if I give you an example, actually. Mm. Um, so I had a patient come to see me over the last year, and he had been a rugby player. He had been a, quite a good rugby player when he was younger, except he'd developed um, uh, problems with his knee after an ACL repair five years ago. So he had persisting pain with his knee. And um, he'd then gone and had a second operation on it, um, and maybe six or eight weeks before he saw me. And the, in that intervening kind of five years, he basically had been told, don't play much sports, don't do much. And the rehab he had had um, was very uh, remedial, shall we say. So we're talking about a guy who previously could squat over 220 kilos. So I don't know, are you pounds where you are? I am kilos? pounds, and I can't even... Yeah, math on four, that. <laughs> let's go. Let's do the math. Like four, four, four sixty, something like that. Four hundred sixty pounds. Right. So yeah, so like, like, like he's not going to win the world powerlifting championships by any means. But as an athlete running around on field, that's a that's a pretty strong dude, right? And, and so he was in his rehab. He was only allowed to do body weight squats and things like that. So he was really instilled in him this idea that you are fragile. He had ongoing pain, and he said uh, to me that, you know, he went and had a second surgery. After the surgery, the surgeon drew him a picture of his knee and showed him all the areas of degeneration and said, look, you know, you just need to not have any impact on this. And he worked uh, in, in a hospital, so he was on his feet all day. And he was kind of saying, well, I don't really know what I'm supposed to do because I, you know, should I be wearing a knee brace? Should I be giving up my job? Because, you know, and we're talking about a, a, a young man in his early 20s with, you know, young kids and has been told, you know, and is afraid to run around with his kids. And, you know, that's highly, highly disabling, right? And so uh, he'd been told he was going to need a knee replacement by the time he was 30. So really strong fragility message that says, stop running, stop doing all this stuff because your knees are degenerative. And so anyway, he came to see me and, 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 and you know, we got him on a journey that was involved getting back in the gym and, and reloading him and making him unafraid to be in the gym and making him unafraid of uh, lifting again. And the key thing is that we started small and it wasn't about me waving, doing some kind of Jedi mind trick and saying, listen, don't be afraid of lifting. Your knee is fine. Those degenerative changes don't exist. It was, it's nothing to do with that. It was more to, for him to experience that when we hmm. loaded it, he, he was actually okay. And then he was able to go back to the gym and load it a little bit more. And he was actually okay. And then he was able to load it a little bit more and he was actually okay. And eventually all the way up over the course of less than a year, he's back squatting more than he was previously. So he's done over 230 kilos of a squat. He's pulled 270 kilos off the floor in a deadlift. He's passed his fitness exam for the police, which involves running, jumping, doing agility, training, etc. He's running um, uh, kind of three to four times a week and has returned to playing rugby, a sport he couldn't play for five years. And he's doing all of this pain-free and hmm. his knee isn't swelling anymore. It's not giving him crunching sounds. He's running around uh, with his kids and all those types of things. And, and the big thing for me along that journey was, was him understanding that it was, it was safe to move. But not only was it safe to move and use it, but experiencing that it was safe to move and use it. And that's really, really important. Um, and so what's key along that journey is sometimes, you know, if you're a patient and you try something with a physio and maybe you go, oh, that made me a little bit sore, is understanding that between you and the physio, you're trying to find the right level. And it's almost a degree of experimentation. 
So I wouldn't just throw in the towel because you did something once and it, and it hurt a little bit. It's about finding the right level that's acceptable and appropriate for you. And, and it's not, the physio will never be able to go, yes, this is exactly the exercise with this many reps and this many pounds, and this will be correct. It's all, it's guided by their knowledge and it's guided by their experience, but it's always going to require the feedback of that patient. And that's why I talk about project management because they are so much a part of the project their feedback is integral to getting it right. And so, so that was the journey we embarked upon, but it was all about understanding that it was safe to move and understanding that it was, um, uh, and experiencing that it was safe to move and load again. And eventually, you know, developing the capacity and the physical capacities to run and stop, change direction and all of those things. And, and so he's back out playing football. And, and, you know, life is always better when you can do the things mm. that you want to do. And so so to patients who've been told that, um, look, you can't do this, there are definitely times, and that's probably the right advice, you know, if they've got something dangerous going on. But if it's if someone's looked at a scan and said, look, this is degenerative, you can't run anymore, or you don't run anymore, there, there's then they should you know, it, or there's nothing wrong with seeking a second opinion and endeavoring sensibly to reestablish those capacities. Now, if, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But a key thing within this and the advice I give is I involved that surgeon in that process. He got an update on this is where we're at and this is what we're embarking upon. This is what we're trying to do. So it's not, it's not kind of circumventing hmm. that person and saying, right, I'm going to cut them out of the process. And I think that's really important. It's about, it's about building a team around that project. Yeah. Um, did you, as you were going through this process uh, with this young man, did, as he started to run and jump and that kind of thing, did he raise concerns about the what he might be doing in the long term to his knee? Yeah, look, that's a, it's a, it's a really, really good, uh, really, really good question. Like we've had some chats about that. And, and the key thing is, is he, he's he, he's he's had five years of pain and swelling every time he's tried to do things and his knee is crunching and being told he can't do anything and so now he's 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 got a um his life back and he's doing his the things that he wants to do in his life and he's actually moved into a career where he's going to be in his feet and more physical more you know so so his whole outlook you know he's he's he's, he's you know, if you want to get all physio-y on, on us, you know, he's, his, his fear of movement is lower and his pain self-efficacy is higher and all these things that we think might matter. Um, but more importantly, on a human level, he's kind of gotten his life back. And, mm. and, and what he was staring at was, you know, for him, he was staring at a new replacement anyway. Hmm. So it's one of those things that, so if, if, if his degeneration, if you will, um, was to um, uh, increase over time, well, it's likely that if we scanned him in 25 years, he would have more de degeneration on scans because he would then be 50 years of age. And so it's really hard to kind of like separate how much of that is, is there. But he, it's, it's, it's hard to say he's doing damage when he's pain free, not swelling, you know, for a year doing the tasks that he wants to do. And so yeah. um, and as you, as you, you know, sort it, of move into the medium term and he's experiencing less symptoms and more function it's it's almost intuitive there that like what i'm doing is not wrong you know it's it's yeah um, and if that was going the other way you guys would have pulled back you know this isn't a, a switch of course flip it's a process that takes a long time and um, so you can, you can sort of make you can continually revisit that, those decisions and, and discuss it you know a hundred percent. And so if he was getting symptoms, we'd change track, we'd change things, you know, and that's the key thing. But, but, but on the subject of, because we started this conversation with anti-fragility, one, one of the great moments along this journey with this lad um, over the last a little over a year is that um, at one point, his friends uh, kind of, I think, I think they may have pressured him, you know, they pressured him to play in a kind of social game of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, football. And he messaged me, or I actually, I, I don't know, I messaged him, made contact saying, look, because it was remote he wasn't he wasn't living in perth and i was like well how did you or, or how, kind of tell me how are you going he goes oh well i played in this game of uh you know football or whatever my mates insert brackets which i probably shouldn't have done because he hadn't really had the go ahead to do that at that mm. point but he, he played anyway and that's life and you know people don't do what they're told and that's how humans are and uh and he goes but and it's it swelled up and it was a little bit sore for a few days but i've gotten back in the gym and everything's going kind of well again. And I thought to myself, that's brilliant. You know, there's one way you could look at it and go, oh no, he's gone out there and done that and he's done himself some damage. But I actually looked at that and said, that's brilliant. 
This is a guy who previously, you know, that was a fear inducing event and, you know, worrisome to have swelling and pain. You'd have to stop and not do. And he, he realized, OK, I did something. I did more than probably what I should have. It flared up a little bit. I get a couple of days rest. I've gotten back on my rehab program and I'm, I'm running smoothly now. And mm -hmm. I, I thought to myself, that's anti-fragility. Yeah. You know, I was like, the, 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 the guy's got it, right? I was like, that is, that, he's got it. And so it just depends on, you know, that, that outlook and that philosophy in some ways will guide those behaviors. But if so, if he saw that as being a major flare up, I've done damage, I've got to stop this process. The wheels have come off the wagon entirely now. Well, then that, that's really problematic. But he'd gotten to that point where he was like, okay, you know, I've done something probably a bit more than I should have. I've had a flare up. That's okay. That doesn't necessarily mean I've done damage. It will probably need a day or two to settle and I'll get back on the horse. And I mean, I was just so enormously mm. proud of him and proud of being part of his journey when he, when he, when he kind of sent me that message. And so I think it's, it really matters. Yeah. And, and it sort of reveals the, the flip side of this, you know, um, it's a it's an it's an attitude it's behavior it's also physiological you know we are anti-fragile sure. in the way that we sort of super con compensate to stress and become more sure. resilient uh, for the stress unlike a diamond right but there is a flip side yeah. to it right you know if he'd have reacted poorly to that then not only is um his mindset going to be more fragile his behaviors will reflect that and then his body will um experience less stress and and become less resilient so it's, it's this complete reversal of the sure of the process that we're hoping to that you've been going up through with him he can go backwards through that and we see that a lot of the time people will come in they've maybe been a year or two out of running because of an injury and it's because and they've they've wound back so much through this process and you know and it's because they've changed their behaviors they run less it hurts when they run a little bit, so they run even less, you know, and it, you can go the other way. Absolutely. And it, and it's a hard cycle to interrupt, and it's a very hard thing to manage um, on your own, you know, and, and, and it's, it's you know, I reflect upon a, a colleague of mine who's been a patient of mine over the years, and he's, he's, he's one of the more knowledgeable people I, I know on this topic, right, in terms of running, adaptation to training, how pain works, all those types of things. He, he knows, you know, as much as anyone I know on this topic. So he really is, is the full bottle on it. And yet when he, he came to me with this persisting Achilles tendon pain and he, he outlined his, his program to me and the kind of path and journey he'd been on while self-managing it. And, you know, I was, I was kind of a bit shocked at first saying oh you know would you have given this to a patient he's like no no but but i tried this would you have given this no no but i, I tried this and, and it, what it showed was that you know no one is objective mm. right we never make objective decisions about ourselves that's just how we are as humans you know and, and we always need and someone to help and give an objective opinion from the outside in i feel you know you look at people like you know serena williams uh you know uh simone biles you're like you know best gymnast you know, best tennis player possibly ever, you know what I mean? You know, but they don't self-manage. They've got mm. coaches, right? Yeah. Because you need someone from the, even if you're really good, even if you know lots about what you do, you still need someone who looks objectively from the outside in and helps to guide those decisions. And I think, I think it's a really easy cycle to fall into where you start to reverse like that. And I think that's where having a team around you that can help give that objective guidance is actually really important. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's a tricky one because we never make the right decision on our own behalf, I think. Hmm. And I think, yeah, it's, it is interesting. And I think that's the most, as rehab professionals, um, I think that's our most important role, you know, it, it's not the, the individual little skills and diagnostic abilities we have, although they're important to be able to do the job. It's that, um, forming a, a team approach to the problem at hand. Um, and helping the person make the right decisions and do the right things as opposed to um, yeah. a sort of um, a one-way do this, do that kind of uh, approach. Absolutely. And I have a, I have a uh, Damien who, who runs the clinic where I work. He, he's a lovely fellow and he's got a lovely way with words. And his way of describing this is that the plumber's tap always leaks. 
<laughs> okay. And so it always resonated with me, you know, you never want to be that plumber, right? You, if you get someone else to fix your taps and it's yep. a bit like that, you know, you're part of the process, but, but sometimes that decision-making um, when it's made by oneself, isn't as objective as it, as it kind of could and should be, I think. Um, and, and that's really wonderful practical advice for runners. Cause I know people are going to listen to this and going to watch it and they're going to have niggling injuries that aren't going away. And a lot of them are going to have advice that they're like, you know, do less, you should run less and that kind of thing. And it's like, that's not necessarily mm. wrong, but if it's an important decision, it's perhaps worth exploring. You know, it's perhaps worth revisiting and and seeing if, um, if anything can be done. And if it's like, like you say, if, if you're trying and you're not getting anywhere, then fair enough. But it's, there aren't any, there are very rarely occasions where we can look at an assessment and um, say some imaging and make make a, a, a sort of black and white statement that this that I sure. can't even remember the last time I saw anything like that in the clinic where I was like, you definitely can do this, you definitely can't do that. You know, it's always like, let's try, let's see. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's 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 it is. It's a process of exploration. It is an experiment, and it requires the consent of both parties, and it requires the knowledge base and experience of both people, and openness and willingness to try things, and also openness and willingness to accept you've explored an avenue that didn't bear fruit. What else can we try? Yeah, yeah, and it's like like you said again. Another useful thing to take away from runners is what can you do? Okay, I can't do this. What can you do? Yeah. And that um, even yeah. starting to explore that, you might discover actually after a few months of doing that, that thing that you couldn't do, you know, maybe it was downhill running or trail running. It's like that's coming back now. You know, my system seems yeah. to be able to incorporate that, whereas it couldn't previously because I've been doing all this other stuff. I've been becoming more resilient and now other things are coming into my remit of uh, capability. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But it should never be a focus on, well, that's a double negative. Focus on what you can do, not on what you can't do. Hmm. Um, I think that's a really uh, excellent place to, to wind up. I'm conscious I don't want to take too much of your time. That was really, um, really informative. Thank you. I think um, runners will get a lot of uh, useful advice out of that. And hopefully um, some bits of hope for anyone who's really struggling with injury or really feels like they, uh, they're in a, in a bad spot. Um, if anyone wanted to sort of connect with you or see what you're up to, is there anything, uh, any place you would like to direct them to? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm on uh, on Twitter as Merv Travers. So M-E-R-V-T-R-A-V-E-R-S. I'm also on um, uh, Facebook as Optimize Rehab. So that's Optimize uh, with an S, uh, Rehab. Uh, so that's where my uh, uh, that that's my presence there, and also uh, clinically, I work at Star Physio in West Perth in uh, Western Australia. Okay, cool. And I will um, I'll put links to all of those places in the description, and I'll also put in some links to those other podcasts with you that I listened to that I really enjoyed, and um, your your discussions on anti fragility and in other contexts because you you had the other one you were talking a lot about strength training and stuff which we didn't really get into today but I know that's uh, something sure. you're really into so I'll I'll link that in the show notes because uh, runners should je- definitely check that out it's a uh, it's a really interesting listen yeah sure look happy to chat to you anytime about strength training that's a a big part of what I do I I fly around the world teaching physios how to integrate that kind of uh in strength and conditioning into how they uh perform rehab for uh all sorts of athletes including endurance runners so uh yeah, yeah. um that's yeah and um, that's strength do, training so for chat. running is uh it's something I talk about a lot so I would I would absolutely love yeah. to bring you back on if I can uh, twist your arm yeah. in a few months to come and talk about that I think uh, that would be a really good podcast too no problem. I was actually looking at your video on Twitter this morning with your sandbag oh, yeah. in your backpack. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you see my so, dog? So he more, was helping than, me with helping me with well, the push-up. Look, <laughs> you know, sports always better when you got a friend. So uh, that's the social <laughs> aspect of it. Uh, that's that's, that's got to be covered. Although sometimes the friend is, uh, um, how should we say, uh, more resistance than help. But <laughs> that's the way it goes. Yeah, no, yeah, that's the reason great. I only so, yeah, knocked like, out three of those push-ups with that backpack. Oh, no. I was like, I thought I'll do no. I'll do five or six for the video. And I was like, oh, God, okay, I'll just edit this. So this, like, 
yeah, yeah, that's how it goes sometimes. But yeah, look, more, Matthew, lovely to meet you, and, and more than happy to chat about that stuff. That's that's very much uh, kind of where my my passion is and, and what I do clinically. And um, yeah, um, if people want more information, that you'll find it on uh, Optimize Rehab. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you very much, Merv. Um, enjoy the rest of your. It looks like the morning or afternoon now. I'm not sure, but I... yeah, it's 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 uh, it's quarter past ten in the morning, and I'm actually about to go for a run. Oh so... man, have fun! I just got back from a run, so <laughs> that's a good time. Very good. Well, thanks very much, Merv. Uh, I'll talk to you uh, soon, hopefully. Take take care.